Hey guys, I'm Carmen, digital editor at Ms. and I'm here today with Amy Ziering, which is Hi. super exciting. Hey Amy, Thank thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Oh, Amy is a multi-award winning and nominated documentary filmmaker. Um, I assume everyone is super familiar with The Hunting Ground and Invisible War. Um, Amy's latest, The Bleeding Edge, is also screening on Netflix and is fascinating slash also deeply disturbing. And so we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and you know, usually, I usually am like, so, an Inception story behind your latest film, but I'm, I'm really interested in the fact that you've sort of, you know, you've spent your career making these activist films, and your films have had an impact, they've led to policy changes, um, you know, and sort of the threat of what's revealed in The Bleeding Edge led some companies to immediately take products off the market, and sort of, that impact there is so important. And is that, do you go into the process of making your films with an intended impact? Do you find that there are things that you do in telling a story that sort of make results like that more likely? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not an accident. It's all super calculated. I mean, um, I guess I don't know what I can say and tell. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, we, we, we definitely think about um, how to make films that will really, uh, it not only inform people, but move them, and mm -hmm. um, also inform people in a way that there's a, a path, uh, you know, a direction. And also we really try and prevent, present things in a very um, nonpartisan way so that we get buy-in from everyone. You know, and it's so that that's what I mean by it's it's thought through and strategic. It's like, well, you know, if with like let's take Invisible War for an example, it would be really easy to make a feminist film and a feminist critique of the military, but we didn't. Yeah. You know, we made a law and order critique of of the problem of sexual assault. So, you know, left and right certainly can agree that predators should be prosecuted mm. and shouldn't be allowed to commit these crimes. And once we got that through way you know, and told the story with that weave and in a very incredibly, you know, pro-military way in honor, I mean, all this, all the men and women we spoke to said, I don't want to participate in the film because this is an anti-military film because the military, you know, gave me three square meals for the first time in my life and, you know, taught me discipline and actually was, you know, it was interesting actually as a feminist, um, I can't tell you how many women told me that the most egalitarian place they ever worked was the military in terms of yeah. sexual politics. You know, that if, if your commander was cool, then like it was, you were this, you, you know, you were treated more equally, you know, than, than they felt that they were ever treated in civilian society. So that was interesting, but to back up. So, so yes, obviously we are thrilled that our films have had an impact, but it also, like some people go, oh, you know, you just told us, it's like, it, we, we think about it. Yeah, and sort of, I think like right now with Me Too, with all these stories and sort of this, I think there's that renewed focus on storytelling as a pathway to change and people telling their truths and um, how do you sort of feel that a narrative does guide people towards taking action, like sort of draw them in and make them want to fight? Well, we're empathic creatures at heart, at least yeah. some of us are. <laughs> <laughs> some of us are socio-empathic. I, I think, and. I, I think women do skew more empathic. I don't, I don't have any stats on that, but it's just from anecdotal evidence throughout my life. So I find that also, and it's sort of obviously Hollywood works on this, you work by uh, presenting narratives that people identify with, you mm -hmm. know, narcissistically, and then they put themselves in that protagonist's shoes, and that draws them into the story. So obviously for us, it's always important to have a really strong narrative that people can, you know, identify with and empathize with. So our films... Like with Bleeding Edge, so we're here to talk about Bleeding Edge. I mean, it's incredibly important to see the film. It tells you things you'll you just simply don't know and should. That's life saving. I want to make totally sure true. Yeah. that. But it's actually really a great storytell a feat of storytelling too. I mean, it's a real cinematic journey, and you know we. We got really, we we're 100% on fresh tomatoes, rotten, rotten tomatoes, right? We're 100% <laughs> fresh on rotten tomatoes. And, um, uh, and I love one of the critics called us the best horror film of 2018. <laughs> um, but it really is a, a cinematic event in addition to an informative narrative. And, and, and the trick 
the you know the trick, but the 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 um, the way to do that we find is all through and what you're seeing is the Me Too movement. It's it's you know just this compilation of personal narratives that really move people. Yeah, and sort of what unique role do you feel like films can play in social movements? Like, what have you sort of besides this spurring people to action and sort of that educational piece? Well, we are we are media creatures, right? I mean, it's not just film. It's I mean, I, I always say when when you know what did Trump say? Um, you know, it's just what locker room talk. It's like there's no locker room talk. You know, um, words matter. Um, all of the input we're getting from advertising, from Hollywood films, from documentaries, from music, um, all of those shape the way we see ourselves and see our world. You know, nothing's innocent or non-ideological. I mean, all of that's really fraught. So um, it's really important in whatever medium you are to be being a responsible storyteller and be really careful that the representations are diverse and the voices are diverse and, um, the narratives you're telling, you know, empower everyone, not just, you know, the, the privileged. Mm. And, and so The Bleeding Edge, which is um, your latest documentary about the incredibly underregulated uh, medical device industry, which left me like scarred for life and calling, oh. calling people like, did you get an implant? Did it have metal in it? Um, and I, it was interesting to see it because I feel like when I first learned about it, I was like, oh, this seems like a departure from the work that Amy and Kirby um, have done before. And then when I watched it, I realized that there is this through line of trauma and violence that is so often inflicted on women's bodies and the bodies of people who have the least power and are the most vulnerable um, and the ways in which, you know, they're silenced either by the culture or institutions, um, in this case, the FDA. Um, and so I'm sort of interested, how did you get from the hunting ground to the bleeding edge? Like, how did you sort of find this new story to tell? Like, what led you there? Well, we're always looking to tell stories that haven't been told before. I think that's something that's a little different about the kind of filmmaking we do. A lot of films, a lot of documentarians recount things that have happened in the past, um, or they take a book and 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 um, translate it, or what's adapt it to film, or you know. So they take the research that's already been done, and we like to sort of break new ground. Mm. Um, and uh, we're always looking for something that no one knows about, the society doesn't know about, and we think they society should know about it. And that's so invisible war, you know, that's another, you know, we just were talking to women in the military and ended up, you know, doing the original research that broke the story of that epidemic, which led to, you know, the hunting ground, which helped break the story of the epidemic of rape on campuses. And I think in part actually led to the Me Too movement because, mm -hmm. you know, that film, the, the, um, the song from that film got nominated for an Oscar and Lady Gaga ended up singing on stage with 50 survivors on stage. And I think that moment, I mean, I know that moment. I mean, you have to remember back then that my talking point for Hunting Ground, um, it's interesting, the media talking point when we're doing press on it was believe survivors. Like that was, and that was like a monumental thing that I yeah. had to remember to say three times yeah. during an interview, no matter what the question was, you know, so, um, uh, I think, I mean, I remember her, you know, the standing ovation and, you know, Kate Winslet in tears and Brie Larson in tears and Steven Spielberg, you know, giving me a hug. Um, I think that kind of unconsciously, you know, maybe somewhat consciously ignited the fire in the women and men in entertainment saying, well, if they can speak up if these students are so brave speaking up and Lady Gaga can speak up, maybe we should too, you know, mm. so, um, and I also think it helped empower finally the New York Times and the New Yorker to to push out articles on Weinstein, that story's been around for 20 years. I mean, it, you know, but I think that CNN came out with The Hunting Ground and PBS came out with Invisible War, it helped empower it, and all sorts of other things, obviously, you know, the work you guys do, the work that everyone on the ground does. But when you say how important are films or narratives, I really think that those two films did help for the first time people were hearing survivors tell their stories, and it shifted the culture slightly. It was like, oh, there's an opening. Oh, maybe women are telling the truth. Oh, yeah. You know, so it was sort of this just domino effect. But now I forgot your original question. But um, I think you said, how do we come up leading? Yeah. So, so we're always looking for stories. Someone came and told us her story. It seemed crazy to us. We were like, wait, that can't be true. And, and to make a long story, there was a 
a, a device that she had had implanted and um, she later learned um, that it had gotten approved by the FDA based on it being similar to another device that had been recalled. That there's a, a, a regulation that as long as it's like something that happened in the past, you can get it approved, yes. even if that product's been recalled. And that to us just sounded like the craziest. Like, yeah, it's like, like, this can't be real. It can't be true, and it is. Yeah. So when we heard that, and we started, you know, when she told us her story, and we started looking at her, we're like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, there's a, there's definitely a, a film here. You know, it's a hard film to make, on, but, um, yeah, but so that's how that came about. Yeah, and, well, I also love just sort of backtracking a little how you talked about sort of that when you were doing press for the hunting ground, which feels like it was yesterday, but was, you know, a few years ago, um, that this idea of saying believe survivors was new. And, you know, I, I got my start sort of in feminism, um, doing work on anti-rape activism. And it was like around the time that the phrase rape culture had started like emerging in the mainstream. And it is really wild to look back on how far we've come mm. in just 10 years or, you know, 20 years on issues of violence. And now it's also really disappointing to see, you know, the hunting ground totally, I think, ignited a fire and led to this huge movement to end rape on campus that we made a lot of progress that now the Obama, the Obama administration's progress is sort of systematically getting erased, right? And same with policies and laws in the military. We're seeing them get rolled back under Trump. And, um, and so with the bleeding edge too, which also deals with how the government is regulating our lives, what sort of messages do you feel you have for folks going into the midterms, but then also I think beyond the midterms, like how do we make sure that this resistance that we have, these issues that are still so pertinent that you've explored, how do we sort of keep pushing and resisting on them for the next you know, months and years that we have to work through what we're working through right now? You know, it's that old adage, win or lose, keep fighting, you mm -hmm. know, and also like there was an Italian Philosopher, political philosopher that I used to read, Antonio Gramsci, and he talked about something called permanent persuasion, that you just can't ever, like, no matter what what achievement you have, you have to continually go back and persuade. And, and so um, that's what, you know, we are currently working on some films in the Me Too space because we want to kind of pile on and accrete, you know, and to the progress that we've already made and not accept the rollbacks. I do hope and think that the genie kind of is out of the bottle. Like we are ultimately, I hope, moving forward. I mean, I think the Kavanaugh thing, you know, was a was an intentional reaction to the progress. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, oh, right, you, you know, we are gonna show you. But um, you know, I think the numbers are kind of on our side and the consciousness. It's it, the consciousness is, is shifting irrevocably, regardless of the small. I also think it's important for all of us to remember that it's it's a minority that's in power now that has a crazy ability to amplify its message so that we think it's somehow a majority and it isn't. And I think that's something that gets lost daily, you know, in the media coverage and everything of what what actually is going on. And we really have to remember this country is the country that elected Obama just two years ago. And, you know, nothing has changed, you know, all of those people are still here. Um, and all the people that voted for Hillary are still here. And all the people that are part of the Me Too movement are here. And we're all still part of this country. We don't have, we don't have the volume and the platform um, to get our message out, but it, it's, it's here and it is moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and you said you're working on some projects in the Me Too space. Is there anything more you can tell us about what's next for you and sort of what's to come? Um, yeah, uh, yes, we're definitely exploring, you know, gender biases and misogyny and different facets of the entertainment industry and going deeper than just, you know, what, the, the, the heavy lift we had to do in Hunting Ground and, and Invisible War was simply like, these stories happen, believe people, you know, that was it. But now that the conversation has advanced, we feel like we can go more into nuanced areas and talk more about intersectionality and sort of the ways in which, you know, trauma and the different sort of ramifications of trauma, the different ways that our whole culture suffers when you sort of have women be traumatized out of the workforce. Um, yeah. So it's going to be a more nuanced um, and complex conversation, but really important and show parts of this issue that no one, that are, we haven't had a chance as a society to communally reflect on and address.
Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much for, oh, for being you. here today. I know thank that you. you have to you have to run and to yeah, run. just thank you so much for taking My the pleasure. time Great and questions. for all that you do. And I know that there is an impact campaign for Bleeding Edge. So if you want to talk a little bit about how folks at home can activate um, around sort of really getting the FDA to step up its game, you know, right before over the summer, we had our bodies ourselves come into the office and screen perfectly safe, which is, you know, a much older film about the FDA's sort of ignorant, purposeful ignorance of the dangers of breast implants. And so when I was watching oh, your film, I just kept thinking like, how many times have feminists yelled at the FDA? Many. There are many times that, um, yeah. And so. I know that from my book to see it. That's oh, totally. You should have watched it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, that's very resonant. Well, the big message from Bleeding Edge is sort of, um, you know, Obviously, we want these companies to have more incentive to uh, self-regulate responsibly, um, but that's not going to happen in the near future with Congress and being in the state it's in, and you know our administration being in the state it's in. So the best we can do right now is be sort of just really informed consumers. Um, <laughs> um, to be really informed consumers, and so you know. Um, to watch the film and then do your homework whenever you engage, you know, when you engage with the medical industry, do your homework and eyes wide open um, because, uh, you know, the industry is incentivized to increase its profits and, and often at your own, at the peril of your own health. And that's the secret none of us know. And that's kind of the big reveal in, 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 in the bleeding edge is that we're all guinea pigs and we just don't know it when it comes to medical devices. 98% of devices are never tested in humans. We're and we, you know, before they're put in us, and like that's kind of astonishing and crazy. Um, so, I think I, uh, so there is a, a campaign. You can go to the website bleedingedgedoc.com, bleeding and um, there's a list of things you can do. But mostly, the best thing is to watch the film and share it. Honestly, I mean, on on the macro on the micro level i think this is a film that like you change you're informed and then you change your behavior and then based on that like that's what the big social change will happen until we can get legislators to watch the film and change policy so those are it's kind of a two-step process but first the groundswell sort of just grassroots um you know uh, grassroots, uh, everyone having their consciousness awakened about this issue and this yeah. industry is the first step. And you will totally want to share it with your friends. I was I was texting people like, please watch this documentary and then <laughs> make sure you're making informed medical decisions next That's time right. you go to the doctor. Right. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah. and I think, you know, because so often with people in power, especially we don't really question them. We're like, you have a degree, you have more knowledge than I do in this specific area. You're supposed to know better and you're supposed to be thinking of my well-being, and I think that that's a through line, too, in so many of your films is sort of this idea that, you know, the institutions that were designed to protect us are often the ones that are instead just silencing us when they fail. Um, and so, yeah, definitely everyone check it out. Go find all your films are on Netflix now, yeah? Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so find Amy's films on Netflix. I'm like, educate yourself. And then, yeah. Please do. Take some action. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.